what they did was they moved to multiple shifts, nothing new there. Uh, they, re they rejigged the way they ran the, rem the remaining shop with the consequence that previous, previous to the earthquakes typically took them three to four days to get a car into the shop and get the car out of the shop the other end. After they'd rejigged it and moved to two shifts, they could get your car in the morning and 80% of the time get the car out in the evening or the next morning. Now, if you were a customer of them, how many of you would be thrilled? Yeah, that's exactly right. You'd be happy to get your car quicker at no extra cost to you. He managed to keep all of his staff on. He did lose a few uh, because there were too many earthquakes, too much shaking. Uh, they just couldn't take it, so he lost a few. But he managed to keep most of his staff, have very happy employees. And how many of you think he might be more profitable? Absolutely, he's making more. Now he's going to have to do more maintenance on his equipment. Uh, but great story, wisdom and hope. He engendered hope in his staff because he had, uh, had uh, care for them. He had the willingness to ask them to help him solve the problem rather than thinking, I'm the leader. I have to have all the answers. So he mobilized the, the creativity that was in his, in his people already. Of those 13 characteristics of resilience, the ones that stood out for me were his willingness to engage his staff, and they were already on board with him, his, his being proactive to look for a solution to keep his people, and creativity and innovation as key factors. And breaking down the silos, because previously his paint shop and his panel beating people and his parts repair were all completely separate. But that was part of the process of rejigging their shop to make the thing work more quickly, more efficiently, without the chaos that might have ensued otherwise. So uh, uh, they're doing well, okay? Key factors, he sought out creative ideas, staff support for work practice changes, which in some settings they say, no, I like my job just the way it is. But they all recognized the need. And he found the silver, silver lining that I mentioned to you earlier uh, with his customers uh, getting a, a better deal, a quicker turnaround. The second case I'd like to describe to you is an IT retailer. They were in the CBD. Uh, their building was damaged, but they probably could have carried on if they weren't in the uh, cordon, uh, which created a real problem for him because he had, he, working from his garage probably wasn't going to work. It wasn't big enough to carry his stock. wasn't big enough to handle the 15 or 16 staff that he had. Uh, although there were many small businesses that did exactly that. They went to their homes, worked out of the garages, did what they needed to do. That wasn't going to work for him. However, he was, uh, how many of you are familiar with the IT cluster? Uh, so in, in Christchurch, probably starting 15 or 20 years ago, uh, the, the ICT industry started working more closely together with one another and collaborating on various aspects. Uh, and he was reasonably involved with them, so he knew the other retailers, the manufacturers, the other software houses, uh, because he was dealing with them in various ways. Uh, and he went and talked to a couple of his uh, compatriots who also ran retail, uh, retail IT-related types of shops. And he found one of them who said, yeah, come and, come and live with us. Come and cohabit uh, with, uh, with our business. We've got some space, even though they were competitors. Now, they weren't head-on competitors. It was probably sort of a 20% overlap between, uh, between their, uh, their, their, the businesses that they worked in. But that willingness for him to step out uh, and uh, approach them. So he had the faith that he could do this. He found that when he got into the new location, of course, he had to moderate what well, he was boss before. He's, not bo he's only sort of boss now. He doesn't own the building. He's got to work in with this other organization just to make sure they've got processes that work. So he had to moderate his approach uh, a little bit. But he found an effective partnership, significantly because he already had the network in place. He already knew these people. He already had the relationships that are so important uh, to the resilience of organizations. And his decision making was very forthright. Uh, he got on and did what was necessary. So uh, uh, loyalty of his clientele was important. They kept coming back, even though he had disappeared. He kept his phones, uh, thanks to I'm not sure it was telecom that tells to clear, but uh, <laughs> uh, so they could still reach his business. Uh, and certainly he found the silver lining because his costs were lower for the location he was at. And there were some synergies they began to discover with the other business. Uh, so although they have merged, uh, they were certainly working more closely together. The last case I wanted to talk about was a hair salon, very successful hair salon. Uh, they, had, uh, they had a uh, business in Manchester Street, it's one of the old buildings there that they owned. Uh, uh, before the uh, 4th of September. When the 4th of September came, of course, most of those older buildings were uh, damaged. They didn't collapse, most of them, but some of them were significantly damaged. So they had to move out, couldn't move back in. Uh, however, 
She, again, was quite engaged. The owner of this business was quite engaged with, the, uh, with the, that industry, knew a lot of the other salon owners, uh, had one of them approach her and say, listen, I know you can't go back into your building. By the end of the month, I'll be able to vacate part of my building. You can come in here. So she was approached by this other, uh, other company, which she was really encouraged by. This sort of stimulated the hope in her. But she found a better deal because she was going to have to wait almost a month from the 4th of September to uh, the 30th of September with another friend of hers who owned, uh, owned a, another hair salon out in uh, another part of the city, and she could move in the next day, which she did, virtually. Uh, so she only lost one day's business and had all of her staff in there. Uh, they managed to recover enough of their equipment, enough of their goods to uh, carry on. Uh, unfortunately, uh, and, and that was only temporary. I think they were there for six weeks, and then they moved to another location which they found that was a bit more permanent, Chewing Street. Some of you will know the business. I'll show you a picture in a moment. So uh, they moved into this uh, location in Chewing Street, much smaller than the Manchester space, so they couldn't deliver the client uh, experience that they wanted to, but they were up and running. They were operating. 22nd of February came, and it's probably a good thing that they had moved out of uh, the other business they'd been working with because that building collapsed and so did their Manchester Street building. So they weren't going to be going in back into Manchester. Uh, but they could stay on, stay on in Chewham Street, and not only that, but another shop just along the way in the block of shops, the owner had had enough. The second earthquake was too much for them. So she picked up that space, which doubled their space. Uh, which was a, a positive thing, a silver lining for them. Unfortunately, they couldn't move, they couldn't, uh, they were out of, out of the, that shop for three weeks. Uh, all of the time, her staff were coming with her. All of the time, her customers were coming with her. She had a really good uh, information system, even though uh, the earthquake shut her down on the 22nd of February for three weeks because it was cordoned. The building itself was quite new, quite safe. Uh, uh, she contacted her IT supplier in Wellington, and they said, yeah, we've got a backup of all of your customers, all of your, uh, all of your uh, data, including all of the appointments. And she and her staff got on the phones. They sent out texts to everybody and said, don't come in. We're closed for a few weeks. And contacted everyone who had a booking for the next three weeks and rebooked them. So they were very proactive in terms of uh, uh, moving on, moving ahead. Unfortunately, uh, I, I, the beginning of December 2011, so before the 23rd December earthquake, uh, they were told that, uh, by Sarah that they were going to have to move out of their building because it was a very a high rise, I think it's eight or 10 story apartment block immediately adjacent to them, right behind them. Also fairly new, uh, but a dangerous building. So they had to move out again. In the end, they had to move six times. That's a lot of moving around, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, and, and quite stressful for her staff. I thought she demonstrated huge courage, not giving up. In fact, she said on the 4th of September when she got, uh, not the 4th of September, sorry, uh, early in December 2011, when she got this notification that we're going to have to move out of this Chewham Street uh, location, she was, she was in Countdown picking up some food. And, and she said, what am I, the person who notified her from Sarah on the phone, what am I going to do with my 18 staff? You know, her first thought was concern for her staff. And then, and, then she, and then she decided she wasn't going to become down. She bought a, bought a box of champagne and said, we're going to celebrate this next move. Uh, now that's, a, that's a positive outcome for her because it was going to keep, lift the spirits. She was going to pass on to her staff the hope that she had gotten from others that had brought her along the way. So she was demonstrating real care for her uh, staff. She had a clarity of purpose, a unity of purpose. She had situation awareness. She knew what was going on around her. She knew her people, and she had the ability to reach out uh, to, to partners to help her keep going. And uh, she had strong staff engagement. The trust and loyalty of her staff, the loyalty of her clientele, some 4 a.m. friends in the industry. What I mean by that term, 4 a.m. friends, is those people who you can phone at 4 a.m., and they won't hang up on you. They'll say, yeah, uh, what, what, can, what can I do to help? And they're hard to come by. Uh, you know, are, are we prepared to be 4 a.m. friends to those that we know who might call on us? Access to the customer info and bookings from their IT supplier. Uh, the government wage subsidy, business interruption insurance, which they had. So they had done a reasonable amount of good planning, more than many SMEs. And they certainly found uh, silver lining a couple of places, including she, was, she lost she, in this process just over the last couple of months. She was losing uh, quite a few of her most senior staff. They'd had enough. 
she decided, I'm going to bring up my new generation. We're going to create a whole new look to the way we run our business. Uh, some real positive things. 13% of her business uh, in uh, January and February was from new customers. Where would I put her and her uh, in these other, other two businesses? Well, I'd probably put the IT re retailer here. Fully recovered, they're doing okay. Uh, probably experienced a disaster. They only had to move once. So I've got them sort of shifted over into the crisis or emergency side of things slightly. Hair salon, definitely bounced back. They didn't radically re redo the way they ran their business, but they were in a disaster. Had to move six times. Uh, you might even push them over a bit closer to the catastrophe side. Uh, and what about the panel beater? Uh, bounced forward. They did a radical remake of the way they ran their business in order to keep it going and got some really, really positive outcomes uh, from that. So in closing, quote from Ralph Waldo Emerson, bad times are, have a scientific value. These are occasions a good learner would not miss. Okay? We need to pick our heads up from the liquefaction and look to the horizon to spot the opportunities. And that's not an easy thing to do, especially when you're in the middle of it. During the recover, recovery, easier to spot. In some cases, though, the opportunities have already passed. There's other, there are new opportunities, though, that present themselves in the recovery. So if I were to offer you some advice, first and foremost, many of you are leaders. Uh, redevelop the virtuous side of that leadership, that care, that ability to stimulate hope and paint the vision, uh, those things that uh, are so valuable. It's your best insurance. Look after your people. And that's, that's been a repeated theme from amongst the other speakers this morning. They're crucial to the running of your business, uh, crucial to being human. Uh, plan well. And uh, that's something that the larger organizations tend to do pretty well. Small organizations often don't do it all, uh, and sometimes to their peril. Uh, and certainly strengthen the ability to adapt, your ability to uh, change and be more agile. Uh, create regular time to find the silver lining. Because unfortunately, we get our heads down in business as usual and in disasters. Get our heads down, trying to make things work again. And some of the opportunities that present themselves just <coughs> zoom past us. And, we've got to, and you actually have to set aside time and to stand back and look for those opportunities. Because otherwise, just nature takes its course and, and you're carried along by the stream of day-to-day -day activity or, or a crisis if that's the mode you're in. Learn from everyday crises. Many organizations experience crises every day. They're small crises. They're, they're, they're not existential. They're not going to destroy the organization, but something goes wrong with the supplier. Your system goes down. Uh, you get an unhappy employee or an unhappy customer. And every single one of those presents an opportunity for you to learn from, from it and improve your resilience. Don't just wait till a disaster comes along in order to build your resilience. So uh, let, let me close with this symbol. Many of you have probably seen this symbol. If you're not sure what it is, it's the Chinese symbol for crisis or disaster. It has two pieces to it. And you've, you've probably heard this as well before, but it's worth being reminded of. One part of it is danger. The second part is opportunity. And so yes, a uh, disaster like Christchurch has experienced has had plenty of danger, and it isn't without its dangers going forward. Uh, certainly the, the, uh, the recovery will have a whole set of pitfalls of its own but they will present huge opportunities. Uh, I come from Detroit originally. I know where I would choose. I choose Christchurch anytime. Christchurch is a great small city and it's gonna be twice as good by the time we get done. So uh, stick with it and uh, make the most of it. Thank you very much.